That's what we bring Hutch in. Hutch, I, I, I'm trying to remember the pain and the agony I felt after 2009 against Florida and the anger I had fleshed out towards the SEC. Dude, this might even be worse for Arkansas fans, the announcement of the scheduling additions on Friday. Yeah, I mean, whenever you look at it, and even even whenever you take a, a you know back up and look at it from a thousand feet, it, it does not look uh, very good for Arkansas, and it, it just doesn't it doesn't seem fair. I mean, you mentioned that 2009 Florida game where it seemed blatantly obvious kind of how the SEC wanted things to go, and it's it's hard to hard to look at this and not feel the same things, even though you you want to say like you know, I'm I'm not a big conspiracy theorist. So I want to say, like, hey, the SEC's not out to get Arkansas, but then something like this happens, and it's like, well, well what can you say? <laughs> yeah. So you, you spent some time over the weekend, and the crux of it, you, you, you can dive a lot deeper, but you essentially took the combined record of your SEC opponents in 2019 and then tried to be a more balanced in your approach. So essentially Arkansas's combined opponent record was 21-11. and 11. Uh, and you went through it with South Carolina, Alabama, Auburn, all the way through the through the list. And it ranges from twenty one and eleven all the way down to thirteen and nineteen uh, in the balance of the schedules. You came up w- with a way where Arkansas, along with let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, was it eight teams would play teams with records with the crossover games. Balance them out would have. 17 and 15 records, and the worst would be 14 and 18. How, how did you go about coming up with this balanced schedule that the league sure couldn't figure out? Yeah, I mean, I honestly thought it would be harder than it was because, uh, I, I mean, putting together a schedule is not easy because you got to make sure, you know, everyone has a certain amount of home games, a certain amount of road games and everything. But I just I sat down with a, a blank Excel spreadsheet and I plugged in the, the two games that were already – uh, set in stone, like for Arkansas, it was at Missouri and then a uh, home game against Tennessee, and uh, just kind of figured out what the, those teams' records were, and I just was like, all right, well, you know, say, you know, everyone talks about, you know, in addition to Arkansas getting Florida and, and Georgia, everyone talks about Missouri uh, getting Alabama and LSU, which also seems like, man, they didn't catch a break, but, you know, they were already set to play. Yeah. Arkansas and Mississippi State, which is two of the worst teams in the SEC, a combined record of, of three and 13. Uh, so it kind of made sense, you know, playing two tougher teams. It kind of balances out. I mean, the schedule I came up with still had Missouri playing LSU and then also Auburn, which is maybe not Alabama, but it's still not easy by any means. Uh, but I just kind of went at it with the, the approach, like, all right, well, this team's already, this, they've already got these games that have you know a, a lesser record, so they need to play tougher opponents, and uh, just kind of built it out from that. And you know, in, in about I don't know, maybe a couple hours, I had settled on one schedule where, as you said, it ranges. Uh, it's like a three-game difference between the mm-hmm. toughest schedule and the easiest schedule compared to the eight-game difference that the SEC came up with. It was uh, it was quite surprising to, to see how easy it was. Somebody like me with, with no experience doing this kind of thing could, could put something together so quickly and so easily. Hutch, on that note, did you work on this solo? Did Nikki help you out, or did you just do this by yourself? <laughs> this was a, a classic uh, Andrew nerding out type of thing because uh, I, I love the type of crunching the numbers type research projects. Nikki didn't even know I was working on it. Uh, it was just one of those things where, as, as soon as the schedule was announced, I was like, "Man, that that's uh, that's not very fair." And so you're t- uh, you're telling me that a one man operation, and I don't know how many SEC over in the SEC office employed. I know Mark Wolmat, who by the way is a University of Alabama grad, was in charge of putting in the schedules. But you're telling me that you found in one day, in a couple hours, a better, more fair solution than what the SEC took. What eight days? figure out you're telling me yeah. that's what happened yeah yeah 26 year old with zero scheduling experience zero uh computer algorithms or uh you know any type of other you know fancy things uh i'm sure if i had a better understanding of like computer type stuff i could have designed a program that spit out like like the perfect schedule but yeah this was just me kind of you know old-fashioned going through and, and copy and pasting games into to an Excel spreadsheet where 
it uh, it worked out. So yeah, it, it, I was I was surprised to say the least because I, I honestly went in with the intent of giving the SEC the benefit of the doubt. I was willing to say maybe the SEC did as good as it could, and Arkansas just got unlucky. Uh, but it doesn't appear that it was luck had anything to do with it. So, based on that analysis, I think at least from the Arkansas perspective. The, the league had an agenda. Fair and balanced wasn't the priority when putting this this schedule together. Would would that be your opinion? Yeah, that's my opinion. I think everyone believes that. Uh, but what frustrates most people, myself included, is that they came out and said that they wanted fair and balanced. And you know, the SEC Network guys were talking all about you know, look at the whole picture. It's not just you know Florida and Georgia that you're adding. Look at what you already had on your schedule. And I'm like, well, that's 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 what I did, and it's still not fair yeah. uh so, so yeah that, i think that was what if they if they truly were like hey we want to try to put ourselves in the best position to have a team or even multiple teams in the college football playoffs then hey go for it but uh don't don't kind of sell us something that <laughs> that's not true yeah. so let's walk through some of the schedule changes you would make and essentially you did say you kept the the existing schedule intact and we're only talking about Remaneuvering, repositioning the two additional games instead of Arkansas getting Florida and Georgia, you would have Arkansas getting South Carolina and Florida. Yeah, and I think that that honestly is what I was expecting when people asked me before the schedule got announced on Friday who I thought Arkansas was going to get. I said that I thought they would either get Florida or Georgia, and then either. Vanderbilt or South Carolina. I just thought that made sense, getting one tougher game and one easier game. And uh, sure enough, that's kind of what what made the most sense whenever you're crunching the numbers. Because I mean, Tennessee was our it went five and three last year, finished third in the conference. Missouri went three and five, which is one of the three teams that tied for for fourth in the East. So you already had a, a decently uh, difficult schedule, mm-hmm. kind of middle of the road. So you would think, all right, well, and add, you know, one tough and one easier game, and and that's kind of what what came out whenever I I did my project. So looking at Alabama, who now gets uh, what Missouri and Kentucky, you have them getting Kentucky still, but Vanderbilt. So I mean, not not a great deal of difference, at least from the from the outwardly appearance of the difficulty. Exactly, and that's because you look at what they already had on their schedule. You know, they get Tennessee every year, which as I just said, finished third in the East. And they already have Georgia, which is coming off, obviously, an SEC East championship. So they already had an incredibly difficult schedule. And so this, this makes it a little bit easier. So, you know, the people aren't saying, you know, I'm sure there were people that saw this from, you know, Alabama. And they're like, oh, well, you're just trying to help Arkansas. Well, no, I was truly trying to make it balanced out for everybody across the board from Alabama all the way down to Vanderbilt. Yeah. So the team that ends up getting Florida and Georgia would be A and M, but they already have Carolina and Vanderbilt. Exactly, two easier opponents, probably the two bottom teams in the East, and so it makes sense that hey, you get the top two teams from the East. It kind of balances out again. The, the whole whole point was to balance and make it where every team kind of had an equal schedule. It's hard to do that when when you got you know. Seven teams to choose from. You got to choose four for each one, but uh, I think that is is definitely fair. Talking with Andrew Hutchinson of Rivals and Hogmeat here on the Morning Rush. Andrew, I was going back and looking at LSU's schedule this past season. People talked about how difficult it was going to Alabama, going to Texas, having to play Florida and Auburn, and then finishing out against Georgia, Oklahoma, and Clemson. For their season overall with the addition to the postseason game, that schedule was mildly tough. But even last year, LSU, which is described as one of the toughest schedules in quite some time, Hutch, they had to play only four ranked games. Arkansas has six. 60% of their games this upcoming season with them only playing 10 are ranked. Hunter Yurchik said earlier this week, this past weekend, that this is the most difficult schedule in the history of college football. Is that too much of a reach looking at the schedule that's ahead of them this year? I don't think so. I mean, I think that a a 10-game SEC-only schedule is probably going to be tougher than what you normally get. You usually have an FCS opponent. You usually have a couple of group of five opponents. And then maybe, you know, a Power 5 opponent like Notre Dame was going to be on this year's schedule. So 10 SEC, 10 SEC games is, is difficult already. 
throw in the fact that you mentioned, you know, six of the preseason ranked teams, which they're all in the top 13 of the coaches' poll, uh, which is, is incredible. And then that doesn't even include a team like Tennessee, which was just outside of the coaches' poll and, you know, who knows, could be in the preseason AP poll. So it is a, a incredibly, incredibly difficult schedule. And I tend to think that you know, usually when administrators or coaches or whatever say, oh, we have the toughest schedule in the country, it's usually hyperbole. But uh, I think Juracek might actually be right when he says it this time. Yeah, no, I agree 100%. So he also had this to say this morning. On the behalf of the Razorback football team, that includes my son, not only a son that's on the team, one that's on the staff as well. And each of the Arkansas Razorback student-athletes that I represent, serve, support, care, fight for, love, we want to play. That's been a hashtag that's really taken away a lot of weight as of late these last couple days. Hutch, what do you think about the players' voice and their opinion that they want to play college football this season? Well, I think it's great. I mean, these, these players are, are using their position. Uh, we've seen them use it in other areas of life that, uh, I think that they they do have a voice, and if they choose to use it, then then that's that's fantastic. And I mean, uh, to see that happening is great. And I think your check, you know, usually whenever you see an administrator make a comment like that, uh, you can kind of brush it off and say, oh, well, he's just trying to save face or whatever. Uh, but I think your check's comments actually hold some weight because, as you mentioned, he's got a son on the team, he's got a son on the staff. So he's got he's got you know, blood in the game and uh, skin in the game. So uh, I think that 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 kind of it, it means something. So uh, I think it's great that the the athletes are kind of binding together. I think the landscape of college football has probably changed forever uh, because these these uh, players are are getting together. I mean, you got guys like Trevor Lawrence and uh, Justin Fields at Ohio State. I mean, these are big time major college football players. Uh, that are calling for a players association and and that might not be the worst thing you know it may not be a a union union uh but there will be some sort of thing where they try to protect players uh i'm not here advocating that they need to be paid by colleges or anything like that but don't anyone take me out of context but to see them wield that power uh is very fascinating and, and interesting to see and and i can't wait to see kind of how it plays out over the future. I don't know if it's going to change anything with the football season, if we're going to get football or not, but uh, I think it's it's definitely a, a seismic shift in the college football world. Andrew, we've seen numerous reports from, from national media that cover college football saying that uh, basically that the, the pending announcements of the cancellation or the, the, the deep postponement of college football will come this week. Uh, where do you fall on that? Do you believe that is truly inevitable, and uh, do you think your last uh, comments there about this players' union tie into that at all? Yeah, I think that the that definitely plays in, you know, that the players kind of wielding their, their power and everything, I think definitely plays into it. The virus plays into it. Uh, I just think that there's a lot of, of chancellors and presidents, obviously the, the ADs and the athletic departments and conferences, I'm pretty sure they want to play. I think they're right there with the the players because they they frankly need the money that that college football produces. Uh, but uh, I think the the chancellors and the presidents, I feel like they're a little bit more hesitant because they don't know what's going to happen uh, with one the virus and then also with the uh, the players kind of uh, grouping together for a players association. Uh, I think they're a little bit uh, scared from all that uh, thing. So. Uh, I think that uh, we could see the cancellation of football. I, mean, I think there's so much smoke there that it, it, it's almost inevitable. I'm hoping that um, I'm hopeful because I, I like y'all. I love football. Not only does my job depend on it, but even if I didn't have this job, it would be a huge part of my life because it's something I've I've enjoyed my uh, since I was uh, as long as I can remember. So uh, I I hope the players push kind of swings the pendulum back the other way, but uh, I just got a bad feeling uh, last night when I was reading everything that it, it could be coming to a halt here uh, sooner rather than later. This seemed to all be, the, the snowball began to, to kind of trickle downhill, roll downhill when the Mac canceled their season. I, I, I sure hope that we don't find out at the core of this that people are, are reacting to what the Mid-America Conference has done. 
I don't think that's what's happening. I don't think they're saying, oh, well, if the Mac has done it, then, then we got to. Because obviously there's a huge difference sure. between the Mac and, and the SEC or the Big Ten or whatever. I think more than anything, it's like, okay, well, now we're not first. Uh, I think we saw it back in the in March, whenever all the conference basketball tournaments were canceled, and stuff like that. You know, I don't think any of the big conferences uh, were first. I mean, I think the Ivy League was first, and then you slowly started seeing other conferences follow suit, and they were just basically waiting for someone else to do it. So they're like, oh, okay, well, we're not the only one. We're not, you know, people aren't going to think we're crazy. So I think that's more than anything that if if it's created a domino effect, it's not necessarily the max influence on them is say, okay, well, now we're not first. Yeah. So, Andrew Hutchinson of Hogbean Rivals, kind enough to give some time this morning. Andrew, I know you're busy with all this going on, so we appreciate you making some time for us, bud. Yeah, thanks for having me on, guys. Oh, good stuff from Hutch, as always. And, again, if you haven't read that article that he put together, you can go to Rivals and Hogbean. It's a fascinating thing. And, again, it took him a couple hours to do what the SEC couldn't yeah. in, over the course of eight days.